HP is doing what is called the cloud platform. And this has two layers of, um, of product. The first one is the Helium OpenStack that is our infrastructure as a service. That it is, um, it's basically a skew out of uh, OpenStack. And this manages all our uh, compute instances, networking, and, and so on, like, a, like a, as a great um, infrastructure as a service platform would do. But the problem is, that from a developer perspective, they don't want to be dealing with infrastructure. What they really want to be dealing with is their code and their ideas, and how can they take that innovation to, to market as fast as possible. And so that's where um, the Helium development platform comes into play. And this is where we're leveraging the, um, the Cloud Foundry infrastructure, but it's, it's also more than just the Cloud Foundry infrastructure. We are we're deeply integrating with, um, with uh, OpenStack, and providing services um, that that, are, that uh, uh, developers can actually leverage for their uh, their solutions and their applications. So, by mar marrying these two layers, then uh, developers can can get the reliability and the services that they want in in and the perspective that they care about. That is again uh, writing code and getting those um, bits out as fast as possible. And so, you, from our uh, webinar, you saw that for our version 1.2 from a healing development platform, the big, the, the big features are, that are coming to market is uh, the .NET support. And so, so, so if you've seen this, and I won't cover that much, uh, cover it that much, but, um, but, but basically, it's a full end-to-end -end solution, and that is the exciting part of it. We're not just bringing just little components as parsley. Um, we're, we're actually tying all of them together to make sure that Windows developers can develop in an environment that they are uh, used to, and um, and we try to we did our best to embed directly on the tools and the environment that they they're, they're used to, it, so they can actually leverage that knowledge that they have today. Okay. So from an architecture for. So from an architecture perspective, from a Helion development platform, um, again, kind of like we have the OpenStack layer, and then we have the development platform, but we also have like the developer experience pro um, uh, portion of it. And from a developer uh, experience, we've, we believe in tools, we believe in language bindings, in CLI, and dev portal, and, and also uh, CICD um, tools. And we also want to make sure that developers can leverage the knowledge that they have. So that, uh, that is the beauty of Cloud Foundry, right? Like they, it brings all this language support and you can write on the code that you're, uh, you know and that, so that you can actually right. develop um, right. and, and leverage that as much as possible. And what is important here to understand is that there's two types of services as well. So we have kind of like what is the unmanaged service where you have a service that just exists and you leverage it. But w then we also have what is called the managed services. And this is where we've also done a lot of work. Um, for example, the MySQL service that we have uh, sits on top of a technology called Trove that provides a full managed application. So um, if something goes wrong, it, kind of like it, it recovers itself. Um, it has auto backups and, and a whole bunch of services that uh, go associated with that service. And, and so that you can actually have enterprise grade. And, and we really believe in managed services on the long run that they're going to, if you want to have an enterprise grade solution, you really have to have some of these um, services being managed. And so here you can actually see clearly where the Cloud Foundry components lie, right? right. So, uh, so, so it is important to understand that the Helium development platform is not only Cloud Foundry, it's like we are adding uh, other things around it to make sure that uh, that it fits well in, a, in our platform. And so, you're, and, so, and so you're adding to it, and so you're continuing to add to it. What are some of the additions you'll be making in the in in the next versions? Um, so I, I don't I don't think we've talked uh, too much on the next version, but we will continue to invest in all of these areas. Okay. So um, we really believe uh, that. So the important thing for us is to make sure that we have an enterprise grade service. Right. Yeah, I, I did. You guys talked a little bit about Project Greenhouse and uh, work you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 
Um, I can I, I'll let uh, Gert talk a little bit more about uh, Project Greenhouse um, just in a little bit so to, to be in context with the rest of the things. But as you saw from our webinar uh, for the .NET, um, there's really several things that we're bringing, right? So from um, uh, first of all, from a backend perspective or a cluster component. So we have the Windows DEA that is an image uh, of Windows that can host applications. And for hosting applications, we have to actually do uh, process and resource is isolation. And today we use something called Prism. And, and this is a really cool technology because we cover, uh, we, we can basically create as, as close as possible as a container as you can have in Windows because Windows doesn't support uh, containers at a kernel level today. And so, so working with uh, with some of the Microsoft guys, we we were able to sandbox these applications and and to provide as much security as we could. Um, and then we also created um, kind of like the, the SQL Server integration. So, um, so so this is um, a service broker that is uh, written in Go, and uh, and what this allows is for your applications to talk to a SQL Server. As well as having a, a SQL Server instance, and so when you create an, an application and you say I do want a service of a SQL Server, what it does it it goes in and creates a database for you and creates the, the appropriate security context for that application to uh, to talk to the database, and that is important to understand as we go into this demo because the only line of code that we do is changing the uh, uh, the configuration uh, connection, and that's where this place in, uh, into place. And then from a developer stack, we actually, it was super interesting because we have two, two programming models, right? So we have kind of like the traditional uh, Cloud Foundry model where you are using your, um, like your CF tools and, uh, and maybe at most like Eclipse. Uh, but then we also have all the uh, Windows developer tools that, and we want to make sure that it fitted it right in both of those places, that it didn't feel like it was uh, like something uh, totally, uh, you know, like it didn't fit into it. And so, so we did a lot of work in that area. And the first thing is that from, a, from, from the CLI perspective, the only change that happens when you want to deploy your application is that you need to specify the stack. And the stack is basically telling the, uh, the, the server uh, or the controller that, um, that this is going to be a Windows application. And that is the only change you need to do. From a, from a tools perspective, though, uh, we uh, created a .NET SDK that allows you to have programmatic access to Cloud Foundry. And, and this, is, this is a component that we actually leverage for, the, uh, for, for example, for the Explorer. Uh, uh, but you could also use it, for, if, for example, you are a power user, a Windows power user, you could actually leverage it to create a PowerShell command so mm -hmm. that uh, you can um, automate uh, some of the regular tasks that you do. So, um, so that's also why we make it available by itself. Um, then you have the MS Build task that, um, that give you the functionality in Visual Studio and through the command line to uh, to manage uh, the application, to basically publish it, to start it, to stop it, restart it. And, and last but not least is the Explorer that is, is basically that. It's an Explorer that allows you to connect to an um, endpoint and um, explore the, the objects that you have access to. And those could be like an application, it could be a service, it could be a route. And, and in the case of an application, you can actually do a couple of um, actions. Again, can like restart, uh, stop, uh, restart, and delete uh, the application. And that, I think that's where you have some of the questions, and I'll, I'll be more than happy to, to give you them on that. Okay. So when you look at the, um, this is the, the chart uh, created. Um, when you look at the solution, uh, the orange parts are kind of like the traditional uh, Cloud Foundry uh, bits. And uh, what we did is we basically created the WinDEA side by side to the Linux EAs. And there you can see how uh, we are isolating uh, some of the resources and how do we allocate, uh, how do we, how all these components come into play. 
Um, Gert, I don't know, do you, do you have any thoughts on, or would you like to share anything in this specific chart? So, so the main thing that we did here, so we, we took the, the work that uh, was done in the prison isolation uh, by the Uhuru software guys, actually, um, which provides us with a way to actually create sandboxing of applications as uh, overall already alluded to. So the core building blocks are effectively, it's like we take the IES hostable core. Um, so this is Microsoft's component that allows you to run an IES environment underneath your own process. And the reason for us to use that is actually to uh, for, be able to provide the highest degree of fidelity for applications. So our objective was really, it's like, there, there are a lot of frameworks and kinds of applications in the .NET ecosystem that deal with HTTP endpoints, so therefore are qualifying applications uh, from that perspective to run inside a Cloud Foundry environment. And we, we looked at as like the various alternatives that were available. So we looked at it's like, okay, we can do this in Mono. And so we evaluated the Mono stack and this, um, we, we did the evaluation twice, actually. We did the evaluation of Mono in August um, when, and this was before Microsoft's open source to CLR host, right, and, and made it officially supported inside uh, on Linux and Mac. Um, at that point in time, it's like Mono was very viable as a m mobile platform, but it's like the, in the internet HTTP hosting stack was not as well developed, and we weren't able to successfully actually host a lot of applications. Um, that was also because of like the lack of frameworks that were available at the time, but also the stability of the HTTP stack. Now with the CLR 4.6 work that Microsoft is doing, um, that actually has changed. Um, so it is, it is providing much more capability um, but there's, there are a lot of frameworks, like WCF, for example, is something that Microsoft, uh, at least so far, has been telling us that, it's like that this will not get into the Bono stack uh, because it's, there's, there's no future for that. It's like they are focusing on the forward-focusing applications. Mm -hmm. So if we really want to look at enterprise developers, um, there was really only one option. This had to run on Windows to provide mm -hmm. them the fidelity mm -hmm. that they could use and leverage and um, that was also like when we talked to our customers about this, one of the key things is like, hey, well, it's like we have a large amount of .NET developers and we want to preserve their skills and their trades. And also we want to be able to take some of the applications that are viable and useful um, so we can actually bring this into the Cloud Foundry lifestyle. So in order to do that, we're banking on the IS hostable core to provide us the highest fidelity um, hosting environment. Now, we've built um, the prison container environment provides sandboxing around this in terms of making sure that this process is running in isolation at the lowest privileged user, that there is no access between instances of prisons, um, and that memory resources, CPU resources are actually contained. Um, the way that we get applications in there is through a build pack. The build pack is the standard format build pack that you find in any Cloud Foundry environment, uh, but it knows how to configure at the end of the day the IES hostable core and go from there. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Hmm. We'll, we can talk about more things if, if you have specific questions. This is the application that we usually use right now for sh showing the technology because it marries these concepts really well. So I just downloaded this application and I'm going to uh, copy it to my demo folder. Okay. Um, well, this happens. Uh, so here, is, just to take a step back, here is the uh, public cloud. This is kind of like how we, you would see your images. Right. So you have your core. Right. Uh, then you have your instance of the Windows DEA and the instance of uh, the SQL Server, so so you can see them running. And then here we have kind of like the console, where uh, where you don't have any applications at all. So so let's just go and open the. Uh, let me just copy the manifest file so for the CLI part of it. Um, 
so Audios Open Visual Studio. Uh, so we support any Visual Studio 2013, including the Community Edition, that, uh, that is free. And so this is just going to prepare the application. And so the first thing uh, to see here is the Cloud Foundry Explorer. And so as the name explains, it's just an explorer where you can actually see your endpoints. And so you just need to um, add your targets and credentials. And we did a lot of work to make sure that these follow the same paradigm of design from other uh, server explorers, like uh, the Azure Explorer or the uh, other server explorers that um, Visual Studio has, uh, to make it feel like it's part of the experience of Visual Studio. And so this last one that I added to in the morning is my public cloud instance. And so what it does, it asynchronously goes in and connects to it and fetches uh, all the objects that I actually have access to. So here um, I have uh, my organization one with my default space. And you can see, as we saw in our console, there's no applications or services or routes, right? And so as this is an application that is, it was just downloaded, the, the, the other thing we need to do is to make sure that we download the NuGet package. And to do so, uh, you just need to right click on your project and, to, and go to NuGet packages. Uh, so if you're not super familiar with what the NuGet uh, is, uh, this is a Visual Studio hosted type of uh, dependency management for developers where uh, developers can go in and get um, uh, packages that allow them to do certain things. For example, if you want to talk to a Redis application, then you could download a, a NuGet for Redis and, and, and use that to connect to a Redis client. So, uh, so here you just need to search for Cloud Foundry. And um, I mean just as soon as the network works. <laughs> So here you'll see two things. Uh, you'll see the .NET SDK, that is the one that we were talking about, where uh, you can actually write programmatic access to Cloud Foundry, or and the MS Build Path. So I'm just going to install this, and it downloads it directly. And one of the great things about NuGet packages is that, let's say that uh, we find a bug or we want to add a new feature, we just update this package, and developers. Uh, can automatically download that um, um, update and make sure that their applications are always up to sync. And so what this does, it enables this, this published to Cloud Foundry uh, menu. And here what you see is a published profile. Um, and, and so the only thing we need to do is, let me just copy my target. Um, it's logging to, to the same, uh, Um, to, to the same account as, um, as I have here in the Explorer. Uh, one of the things about skipping SSL validation is that if you have a custom certificate, like how I have in this environment, you have to check it. If not, you cannot connect. Um, and, and here, you just need to fill out a little bit of information. So you need to say that it's going to be a, a Windows stack. Uh, what is the name of the route of how you want the access to happen? And then, um, and then you just need to write the, the service. So you start with the service name, then the type, that is MSQL 2014, and then, um, and then the, the plan, which is free. Um, so you have two options. You can actually build locally, or you can build um, in the server. Mm -hmm. And so, so it is important that, that um, depending on your uh, company, um, uh, requirements on how you want to do it. And, and as you can see, if you say in the server, you'll have the configurations of how you actually have them here. So let me actually just say this really quick so, so you can see. Um, um, so, so here you can actually say, okay, I want my, my build as a, as a release or a debug. And um, and then when you save these things, you can actually have published profiles for each uh, application and endpoint that you, you want. So if you double click this, then you will actually get it. Um, let me just wait for it to, so, so you can see that it just got saved. Um, 
let me just actually save. I forgot. So one of the things that you need to do before publishing for the first time is you, you actually have to build so all the packages get downloaded, especially if you're going to build uh, locally. So we did that. And then, um, so as you can see, it actually built it correctly. And so, so what this does, it actually uh, kickstarts the build, and then now it's copying all the. Uh, this is a web uh, a web page, so it copies every single page that got built, which is really not a build, but it's just it's a next copy, and um, and this goes through the whole process of uh, binding, uh, creating the service, binding the service, creating the route, binding the route, and. Um, and at the end of the day, you're going to have um, kind of like your route. So it, it, it takes it takes less than a minute. Uh, so so there you can see that it's uh, finding the route. Now it's creating the uh, the SQL Server instance. And uh, and here this is where I was explaining that what it does it creates actually a, a database inside that um, SQL Server uh, um, instance. And it creates random credentials for you, uh, and and actually this is gonna fail because I failed to update my code. So uh, it will stage it, but you will not be able to connect to the database because uh, the line of code that you need to change is uh, is this configuration string, right? So um, let me actually my apologies, I, I forgot to do this. Um, So, uh, so this, this is just going to finish, and so, so the application is built, and um, and it and it's okay. But if I actually let, let me show you here, it's going to show uh, the application and uh, the service and the routes. The only problem is that this application will not be able to connect to this uh, SQL instance. So, if I say viewing browser. Um, The, the first time that you open an IIS application, uh, it has to cache everything, and so sometimes it takes time, or, or even there's like a break, but it works. Uh, so, but if I want, I want to go to one of these tabs, it will not work because it doesn't have the credentials. So let's just let me update again. Um, in the meantime, do you have any questions? Um, no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm recollecting. I remember seeing a little bit about this in the demo, um, um, and so what we're doing here is um, you're setting up the profile and and preparing and preparing for what exactly? So, okay, good. There we are. So, so the part, so the part that happens here is like so the, the published profile. Pr provides us with the information of what the target is and where you want it to deploy to. Um, it, may, it has one other uh, piece of information, which is the distinction, as Alvaro pointed out, between local and uh, server-side builds. And so okay. regardless of, what, of where you build, at like the next stage in every application inside Cloud Foundry is that the application then is getting staged. Yeah. So what happens? What happens here is that um, if you set it's like build on the server, we will we will package up the information from the project, and we'll send it over to uh, Cloud Foundry. At that point in time, Cloud Foundry will say it's like, oh, okay, I received this package. Um, it will detect what kind of application it is. It marries it with the build pack associated with the kind of application. Okay. And because if you, if Alvaro, if you can go to the uh, Explorer and click on the app, right, right, you will see that detected build pack. No, 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 no. In the property window, oh. it's like you oh. see that the the, detect, the detected build pack is IIS8.net. So this is something that if like Alvaro actually didn't express, right? It's like he didn't yeah. actually explicitly made it that says like use this build pack. So what happens is like we, we upload the information to the server. The server says like, hey, this is the application. It detects what the build pack is that it needs to use. It will create a staging tarball out of that distribution. 
And then it's like that staging tarball can then be transferred on an instance of the application being the DEA, right? And so this is the standard dance of in Cloud Foundry of how applications, the application lifecycle works. Yeah. Um, now, if the app, if the company or the, the developer doesn't want to push their source code into the system, they could do a local build, and that means is like that the the whole set of binaries and, and artifacts get produced locally, <laughs> then that only the result gets packaged up and passed on to the server. The server doesn't then have to do really much beyond say, oh, I've seen this is a binary payload. It's already been built. Um, I just have to unzip this or unpack this and make it into a, um, a, a drop that is like I can give to the application and start it inside the IS hostable core. Okay. And so, so now, like, I just went back to the application, and now you can actually see uh, uh -huh. that this application uh, is 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 working correctly with uh, connecting to SQL Server. Let me, uh, and then here. You can just choose the date where this student gets uh, added, and this actually creates an entry in SQL Server and then fetches fetches it back, and uh, and and here you can actually see the end-to-end -end integration. Now, the other thing that I want to show you is um, so if we go back to our console, you will see the application uh, here in the in the UI, and the great thing of all the work that um, Gert's team did is that it. They feel and look like any other application in Cloud Foundry. So they report back how much memory they're using. Uh, you can actually see the, uh, kind of like the droplets that uh, you have, like basically the uh, app history. Um, you can go in and browse the files through, uh, through the console, and you can actually see the logs from the application. So uh, this being an uh, IIS app, you, it's important to have the, uh, the logs for uh, for your uh, for your application, and it also embeds the in the log stream. So if you, if you see everything that we saw in Visual Studio, it's accessible through the log stream uh, command. Now, even more exciting is that um, uh, sorry, when, uh, so if you go to to instances, um, they, they 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 behave the same way. So you can actually set. Um, how many instances do you want? And if you uh, have auto scaling set on, uh, like they will auto scale for you, um, depending on the load that the application is having. So, uh, so you can create one or more instances of this application, and they will get uh, created into into the DEAs that you have. You can have more, one or more DEAs to uh, balance your load. Yeah. So. Okay, so now you can see, okay, you can see the, the instance itself. Yeah. Yeah, how it's behaving there. How do you... So, for example, here. I'm sorry? And then you, and then once... Here you can actually see. Uh, I can, you, can start, you can see it. Can you, can you drill down and to see how it's behaving in there? How is what? Uh, so, we're, we're seeing the instance here, right, and it's running. The application's running yeah. on the instance here. Um, yeah, and what's the monitoring that's involved with this then over uh, of that? Of that? Um, so, the, do you want to the health down? monitor? Yeah, so health monitor is is basically monitoring instances of DEA instances, right? Okay. And so, so there is there is communication going on over the Nets channel about is like this what is going on inside the application and if it's healthy or not. Mm -hmm. Right, um, and so that that is the 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 information that is being reflected uh, okay. by uh, by the system, and that shows up in the uh, in the cloud events actually um, that we expose as from the monitoring tool. Okay, and so that's where it's like if 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 a node would degrade, for example, um, if an admin would be behind this portal. It actually through a web socket call is like the actual there will be a pop up that shows up. And it will say like, "Hey, there is a node that is being degraded." If you would go to the admin uh, console, um, yeah, admin clusters, cluster. 
of cluster nodes. As like these these roles will turn red uh, or they go far if there are instances that are actually if something is wrong. So this is at the role level, and then it's like the application itself will will have the same level of information. Where it's like if it's not running correctly, it's like that information will get exposed. Okay. But yeah, that's the, the health manager's task inside the Cloud Foundry world, and that's that's the same thing as like we're integrating in the standard health monitoring log, uh, song and dance that is going on inside a Cloud Foundry cluster. So this has exactly the same kind of behaviors as a Linux app. Yeah. Now, it's like in Linux, is like the main way to look at it, of course, is like you look at the pit of the file and or of the pit file for the, uh, for the process to see if he's actually alive. Um, here is like we're, we're monitoring the process ID and we're, we're getting information from the hosting information uh, service itself because this is running as a Windows service. I was just, I was asking, I mean, monitoring is becoming, is coming up a lot in conversations that I've had lately. Uh, Especially and and the, rightfully so, right? It, yeah. it, it is the, you can, you can create incredible tech, but it's like if you can't manage it, um, yeah. it it's like you, there is, there's, you're going to spend too much operational cycles in actually doing so. And so sure. this is why it's like we, we spend a lot of time integrating Windows into the ecosystem so it can actually leverage the standard workflows as they exist inside Cloud Foundry. Yeah. 